none of those things qualify me for the um, talk that I'm about to give. <laughs> so um, let's just say that I, I, I like to roam. Um, I'm, I'm going to say in advance that this is um, a synopsis of a much longer work. Um, and so I maybe, I don't know, I, I, I worry that I'm going to just send it all over the place. Um, this is actually first things first. Let me get my drug in me. Thank you, darling. So that's okay. No, no worries. Oh, you were so lovely. No water won't do. <laughs> I actually, I, that's so thoughtful of you, but I, I need the caffeine. Yes, thank you very much. <laughs> Great, now this is going to be a resounding talk. <laughs> um, so the, um, the title of my comments this morning is Feminism and Heavenly Mother, and that's part of the problem because you've got a multi-headed hydra on one side that will take, you know, books, and books have been written about the topic, and then there have been a number of books written on the other. So compiling these two um, subjects into 25 pages has um, taken an incredible amount of brain work and anxiety. So I'm going to start off with um, the first part of it, setting the stage. Um, patriarchy may be as old as recorded history, but with the production of the Christian canon, male religious authority made the paradigm virtually impregnable. Appropriation of the Jewish creation narrative especially added a divine decree to historical fiat. Thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. The male deity tells the first woman. Timothy reaffirmed that the original sin was female in origin. Adam was not deceived, but the woman, of course, being deceived was in the transgression. Catholic and Protestant churchmen alike heaped abuse upon abuse on women over subsequent centuries, and the condemnation was always traceable to Eve. And for Augustine particularly, the sexual sin instigated by her. In his letter to, to Laetus, Augustine argu argued, what is the difference, whether it is in a wife or a mother, it is still Eve the temptress that we must beware of in any woman. However, before Augustine extended his misogyny to infect the hearts and minds of millions of Christians, there was another gospel, one which taught that humankind was inherently good and inherently divine, particularly Eve, and that mortality rather being a fall into depravity was rather an ascent into the necessary educational experience that would empower humankind to become more like God rather than less. The Greek father Irenaeus was one of its champions. In Adverse Heresis, he asks, how then will any be a god if she has not first been made a woman? Now, of course, I'm trans, I'm feminized, but it's, it's man, of course, naturally, so. <laughs> I'm just taking literary license. A theological license, perhaps. How immortal if she has not, in her mortal nature, obeyed her master? First, to observe the discipline, which of course is um, the etymology for which is teaching of, uh, of women, and thereafter to share in the glory of God. Mortality, therefore, is a garden in which man may at length reach maturity, becoming ripe through these experiences. Even earlier, Origen had said that the fall was necessary and educative, not tragic and misguided. You, the soul, could not have reached the palm grove unless you had experienced the harsh trials. You could not have reached the gentle springs without first having to overcome sadness and difficulties. Notice the word is not sin. Sadness and difficulties. The education of the soul is an age-long spiritual adventure, beginning in this life and continuing after death. Unfortunately, it was August Augustine's theology, bolstered by Philo of Alexandria, that became a basis of traditional Christian theology and Western culture generally. Eve's conduct, Philo said, led to all kind of wickedness, at which the father of all was indignant, for their actions deserved his anger, and accordingly he appointed them such a punishment as was befitting. The feminine response. The feminist response. 
clearly any challenge to patriarchal supremacy, any movement in the direction of an equality between the sexes could only emerge in defiance of or in blatant disregard for Christian dogma, as it was preached post-Augustine. In her vigorous push for female emancipation, Elizabeth Cady Stanton attempted to wrest the scriptural text from its patriarchal grip and reframe it along feminist lines. Her weapon of choice was naturally enough a deeply revisionist feminist reading of the Bible, one in which woman would be raised from her ignominy in the former male-centric text. In her introduction to the woman's Bible, Stanton writes, from the inauguration of the movement for women's emancipation, the Bible has been used to hold her in the divinely ordained sphere prescribed by the Old and New Testaments. Canon and civil law, church and state, priests and legislators, all political parties and religious denominations have alike taught that women was made after man, of man, and for man, an inferior being subject to man. The fashions, forms, ceremonies, and customs of society, church ordinances, and discipline all grow out of this idea. Stanton's truly brilliant insight, however, too radical even for many of her co-suffragettes who distanced themselves from the work, was in her recognition that the subservience attached to Eve and her descendants was inseparable from an absolute patriarchy in the heavens. The two were indissolubly connected. As she states without apology, the first step in the elevation of woman to her true position as an equal factor in human progress is the cultivation of the religious sentiment in regard to her dignity and equality, the recognition by the rising generation of an ideal heavenly mother. Stanton finds textual support for such a move to in a plurality of gods indicated by the let us behind creation. A heavenly father, mother, and son would seem more rational, she maintains, than three male personages as generally represented. Her collaborator, Lily Devereux Blake, also challenges the reading of Elohim as singular and inserts the grammat grammatically correct plural form. She attributes creation to a council of gods acting in concert, proving to her satisfaction that Hebrews were in early days polytheists. If the Godhead consists of father and mother in holy equality, then from the creation, Adam and Eve made in their image would be fully equal in dignity and authority, she reasons. Consistent with Genesis 5.2, God called their name Adam, she observed. over woman. Stanton and her collaborators, hostile reception notwithstanding, had correctly addressed the problem. Female subordination and patriarchy alike rested on twin pillars, a uniquely male gender trinity and a human creation narrative that imputed a divine model behind only one half of the race, relegating Eve and her female progeny to secondary status. A century later, Virginia Ramey Mollencott wrote that whereas women had made significant strides in the secular domain, the language of Christian preaching, prayer, and hymnody was still laden with exclusive sounding references to men, man, brothers, sons, and the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Second and then third generation feminist scholars continued to aver that while a theme of male-female equality and mutuality informs the biblical text from beginning to end, it does not seem to have registered with a dominantly male religious leadership. History, however, records some significant, significant exceptions to this neglect. The feminine aspect of divinity has been championed by the earliest Christian writers, including Clement of Alexandria, John Chrysostom, and through the medieval writers Thomas Aquinas and Gregory Palamas as well as by mystics such as the anchoress Julian of Norwich. It is Julian whom Mollencott claims to have developed the image of a Christian feminine divinity more fully and more centrally than any other medieval author. Aaron Fogelman writes that the 12th century Cistercian monks, uh, for the 12th century it's Cistercian monks, excuse me, the image of Christ was that of a compassionate, loving, nurturing mother who creates and sacrifices. 
Caroline Water Walker Bynum suggests that a god who is mother and womb, as well as father and animator, could be a more sweeping and convincing image of creation than the father god alone. This image of Christ as a nurturing mother as well as the creator god also became part of numerous radical pietist groups in the early modern period, as well, as, well as including prophetesses and visionaries in England and mystics in Germany and some Puritan theologians in New England. Shakers also posed an unusual challenge to divine patriarchy, post positing as they did a female incarnation of Jesus in Anne Lee. Shaker medium Pauline Bates, however, went further. The deity consists of two, she wrote, male and female, the eternal father and his co-worker and eternal mother, wisdom. In all these cases, of course, with a possible exception of the Shakers, the constraints of a Trinitarian model allow at most for the addition of feminine dimensions to a unitary God. Extending Katie Stanton's decisive break with an androgynous deity, Elizabeth A. Johnson proposes a feminist ethics that allows for the divine collaboration of differentiated selves. Um, I'm quoting her. The self is rightly structured, not in dualistic opposition to the other, but in intrinsic relationship with the other. Rather than we, meaning not they, we and they are intertwined. Neither heteronomy, exclusive other directedness, nor autonomy, in a closed egocentric sense, but a model of relational independence, freedom in relation, full related selfhood becomes the ideal. A number of contemporary feminists suggest a reading of Genesis 1 and 2 that allows for the complete equality in the relationship of two distinct individuals. When the priestly author of Genesis 1 depicts God creating the human race in the divine image and likeness on the sixth day, the text makes clear that the complement is intended. For male and female, all members of the human species are equally favored with the theological identity of imago dei. Duality, not androgyny, is implied. That Joseph Smith, the founding father of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, understood that Adam was the surname of the couple is indicated by his replication of Genesis 5-2 in Moses 6-9. In the image of his own body, male and female, created he them and blessed them and called their name Adam. Adam, um, Adam therefore, is the surname of the couple. Um, so this equality um, I'm hoping to show is also represented, is a replication of the equality in heaven. Stanton, Mon, and Cotton Johnson are arguing, however, from embattled positions. It is, it is a slow and arduous mode of engagement, taking on the cannon by storm as did Stanton and other first wave feminists resulted in little, if any movement for women on the ecclesiastical field of the 19th century fortified, was, fortified as it was by resistance to massive ranks of male clergy. Three, challenging sola scriptura. Without an authoritative text emerging to challenge more explicitly the sola scriptura, little space could be found to navigate a significant challenge to a male-centric deity. In 1830, just such a text emerged from Smith's mind, which produced two paradigm-breaking texts in rapid sequence. Both emphatically resituate Eve as the instigator of a human ascent rather than the precipitator of humanity's fall, the Book of Mormon and then the Book of Moses record an approbation of Eve's decision that turned Adamic catastrophe into divinely ordained progress. It would be hard to imagine a more potent basis for a religiously sanctioned feminism than a reconstruction of Eve as valiant, courageous, and man's equal at the very least. While these 1830 texts eliminate the bases of religiously founded patriarchy, Smith's subsequent innovation of a heavenly mother challenged the patriarchal monopo monopoly of heaven, assigning the feminine divine equality with the male divine. Whereas many current Christian feminist theologians are attempting to advance a feminine dimension to God, Smith accorded heavenly mother a full, full personhood and full autonomy in the divine pantheon. 
the rehabilitation of Eve occurs clearly, if directly, first in Second Nephi, when the patriarch, patriarch Lehi assesses the significance of the choice she made to eat of the fruit of the tree of wisdom. Tree of wisdom. Quoting Lehi. And now behold, if the couple Adam had not transgressed, they would not have fallen, but they would have remained in the Garden of Eden, and they would have had no children, wherefore they would have remained in a state of innocence, having no joy, for they knew no misery, doing no good, for they knew no sin. But behold, all things have been done in the wisdom of him who knoweth all things. Adam fell, the couple Adam fell, that men might be, and that they might have joy. Eve's own voice on the matter is heard in the Book of Moses, which Smith produced mere months after publishing the Book of Mormon, in what might be titled Eve's Ode to Joy. She exclaims in the aftermath of their transition into mortality, were it not for our transgression, we never should have had seed. It was not happening without eating the fruit of the tree of wisdom. We never should have known good and evil, which is interesting because God says the exact same thing in Genesis 3.22. They have become as one of us, knowing good and evil. Um, most Christians take that as, as a skeptical uh, comment or ironic, but for us, it is literal. The, the ingestion of the fruit um, uh, helps uh, Eve and Adam First, Eve and Adam become more, not less, like God. They have become as one of us. Interesting, he notes, he uses the same wording, good and evil. So evil, I don't think, means what we think it means. But I don't have time to cover that today, unfortunately. Um, let's see. Uh, we should not have known. And we're talking about this in the Hebraic sense, so experience, uh, good and evil. So I'm just going to change it now. Good and suffering and the joy of our redemption and the eternal life which God giveth unto all the obedient. This move from Paul to ascent represented a decisive break with Christian orthodoxy. Original sin may be, in the words of one cont contemporary theologian, a cultural embarrassment, but it is nonetheless the mainstay of the Christian theology of human nature and the human condition alike, a part of the faith of the whole Christian world, in the, world, in the words of um, Charles SMK, presumably Sarah M. Kimball, exhibited a keen understanding of Mormonism's theology. Eve, she wrote, is entitled to reverent honor for taking the initiative and braving the peril that brought Earth's children from the dark valley of ignorance and stagnation and placed them on the broad progressive plane where they, knowing good and evil, joy and sorrow, may become gods. For her courage and initiative, she should receive encomiums of praise shared by our great paternal who, though reluctantly, followed and aided her in her heaven-ordained enterprise. In her seminal work, Eve and the Choice Made in Eden, Beverly Campbell posits the advent of Eve is a harbinger of a profound spiritual awakening for Adam and by extension for us all. Eve was the embodiment of wisdom and was recognized by Adam as the better half of himself. John Milton's text, Paradise Lost, um, subversive in so many ways, uh, renders this description of Eve. When I, Adam, approach her loveliness, so absolute she seems, and in herself so complete, so well to know her own that what she wills to do or say seems wisest, virtuous, discreetest, best. Authority and reason on her weight, greatness of mind and nobleness their seat, build in her loveliest and create an awe about her. However, as Katie Stanton and her collaborators correctly deduced, any reconceptualizing of Eve's and woman's status cannot be separated from the theology of divine gender implicit in any conception of the Godhead. Any movement that went further than merely pasting onto a male deity trappings of the feminine would require a whole-scale reconstruction of the Trinity. Of the innumerable ten tenets over which Christians may, may, may disagree, none has been so central to the question of orthodoxy is the doctrine of the Trinity, argues Terrell Gibbons in his book, Wrestling the Angel. We have to show up somewhere, so here he is. 
He's not with me, notice. But he, you know. What is meant by personhood in the Godhead has, of course, been a perennial subject of furious debate. Karl Barth fears that the idea of a tripersonal God will lead to the false assumption that there are three distinct personalities in the God heaven, or Godhead heaven forbid, and Karl Rahner is equally concerned that the same idea will result in tritheism. Not only does Smith validate Barth's fears, he also confirms Rahner's. Joseph Smith's rejection rejected Trinitarianism outright. I have always declared God to be a distinct personage, Jesus Christ a separate and distinct personage from God the Father, and the Holy Ghost with a distinct, was a distinct personage and spirit. And these three constitute three personages and three gods, he proclaimed in one of his most emphatic statements on the subject. From an explicit tritheism, Smith also makes explicit a female presence among the divine beings. Anticipating Stanton's reading of Genesis, Smith, inter Smith interpolates the very words that make a heavenly mother real and distinct. God created man in the likeness of God, made him in the image of his own body, male and female. The book of Abraham, of course, uses the plural form throughout. Um, we made uh, Adam and Eve in our image, and then there, is a, there are a number of um, references to councils. The double revolution occurs in the space of a scant half dozen words. God is embodied, God is dual, two distinct beings. A heavenly father and a heavenly mother comprise the divinity. The, uh, the idea will find its most forceful and unabashed formulation with the apostle Erastus Snow. There never was a God, there never will be in all eternity, except they are made of these two component parts, a man and a woman, the male and the female. Notice what is not what is absent. A man and a woman, the male and the female. He doesn't say husband and wife. I found that really intriguing. Smith's passage, however, did not see print until the 1867 edition of the Bible published by the reorganized church, and then 11 years later in the 1878 edition of the, of the Pearl of Great Price. Smith's own recognition and elaboration of that explosive idea is impossible to trace precisely. This would suggest, as Linda P. Wilcox notes, the idea of a mother in heaven is shadowy and elusive, floating around the edge of human consciousness. Smith's recognition of a mother in heaven first appeared in print through the intermediary of his close associate W.W. W. Phelps. In a letter published in a church newspaper, Phelps declared simply, Thy father is God, thy mother is the queen of heaven and imagined a scene where Christ was anointed with, proclaimed through the persona of Joseph Smith, the mystery that man hath not seen. He is our father in heaven and mother the queen. While Phelps's hymn faded into oblivion, another hymn written in 1845 gave effective canonical status to the teaching of a heavenly mother. Smith's plural wife, Eliza R. Snow, first propounded publicly a heavenly mother as God's consort in a poem she wrote. It appeared first in the church's magazine in November 1845, and was then integrated into Mormon hymnody and is now known as Oh My Father. The pertinent lines are, and I hope Jill, our narrator, is not here. I am sorry, I'm so not a fan of Eliza's poetry. This is going to be painful for me to read, so <laughs> bear with me, bear with me. In the heavens are parents single, no, the thought makes reason stare, truth is reason, truth eternal, tells me I've a mother there, see? When I lay this mortal by, father, mother, may I see you in your royal courts and high, with your mutual approbation, let me come and dwell with you. I probably should have just not read that rather than adding my, <laughs> my non-encomiums of praise. Um, still, it is there, it is theology, this is good. Eliza Arsenault stated that the teaching of Heavenly Mother came from her first husband. Susie Young Gates confirmed that Zina D.H. Young and Elizabeth and Eliza both learned the doctrine of a Heavenly Mother directly from Joseph Smith. However, President Wilford Woodruff attributed the revelation to Snow herself, stating that hymn is a revelation, though it was given unto us by a woman. The decade of the stunning. The decade of the 1890s marked dramatic upheavals in Mormondom. Polygamy had been formally abandoned in 1890, but would continue to be practiced surreptitiously into the early 20th century. In 1894, the church abandoned, it abandoned its conception of a dynastic heaven in which persons were sealed to prophets only. Henceforth, parents would be sealed to children and children to parents in a manner consistent 
were the words of Malachi that had launched the whole theology of eternal sealing. Do we understand? This dynastic sealing went on for 50 years. It was a long time. And, um, you know, this, this blinkeredness, um, I, I think, which was caused by polygamy and the, and the, the creation of dynasties, um, uh, made what I feel is a very clear reading of Malachi um, very ambiguous. Leading LDS female intellectuals were writing and publishing their views and collaborating with natural figures in the women's suffragette movement. As Boyd Peterson writes of this moment, Mormon women not only had a room of their own, so um, very much like Virginia Woolf, but they also had their own printing press, acting as proprietors, editors, and sub-editors. In 1895, they employed their press to publish an advanced copy of the opening chapter of Stanton's Woman's Bible. They clearly felt moral and theological solidarity with a text that proclaimed equal representation of female and male in the Godhead, along with a commensurate equality of human genders. Furthermore, Mormon women had scriptural texts and prophetic authority to support them in their cause for equality in heaven as on earth. David Paulson and Martin Pluto demonstrate conclusively the long record among LDS leadership of affirmation for the belief in a heavenly mother. The glorious vision of life hereafter is given radiant warmth by the thought that we have a mother who possesses the attributes of godhood. Young Woman's General President Elaine Cannon adds that Heavenly Mother shares with God the Father the divine attributes of glory, perfection, compassion, wisdom, and holiness. The Book of, Mormon, uh, excuse me, the Book of Moses states that the entire cooperative activity of the Godhead is to bring about the eventual, eventual immortality and eternal life of all humankind. In recent years, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints has been more forward in professing this long-neglected doctrine. Not only does Heavenly Mother receive more frequent mention in general conference talks, a church website now proclaims that all human be beings, male and female, are beloved spirit children of Heavenly Parents. Um, this, is, this is questionable. This is actually argued against um, in the Book of Abraham, uh, where we are described as um, spirits, souls, and uh, intelligences. Um, the passage uses the changes into interchangeably, um, and that we are coexistent with God. So the literality of the spirit children may not be, uh, well, does not find support, I, 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 I find, in the script, our scriptures itself, themselves. This understanding is rooted in scriptural and prophetic teachings about the nature of God, our relationship to deity, and the godly potential of men and women. As Paulson and Pelida document, several church leaders have affirmed that Heavenly Mother is a fully divine person and have used reverential titles such as Mother God, God Mother, God the Mother, God the Eternal Mother, and Eternal Mother in referring to her. Lacking religious authority, Stanton and her cohorts invoked a scholarly community to make their case. Their pages include scattered references to biblical scholarship, experts in antiquity, language authorities, and commentators to buttress their vision of a heavenly mother and other theological revisionism. You're bringing donuts after lunch. In a <laughs> I don't know if you're here, Pk. That's what Boyd does. Boyd does to his students. The phone rings, and they're, they're, you've got to bring donuts for quite a few people. I'd like jam in mine, please. <laughs> their pages include scattered references. I've said all of that. Um, in a similar way, Joseph Smith readily appropriated pertinent voices in support of his heterodox teachings. Thomas Dick on eternal progression, Charles Buck on baptism for the dead, Adam Clark on numerous topics, Hebrew lexicons for revisioning creation, and so forth. Smith's conception of an Adamic dispensation in which the fullness of the gospel was taught to the couple, even Adam, made ancient studies an especially compelling resource for his claim that Mormonism was a restoration and not an invention. Smith had clearly set the pattern both with his production of ancient texts and his insistence that a wealth of lost truth was yet to be discovered. Enthusiasm for recovered ancient writings swept the Mormon church. Brigham Young, on a mission in England, wrote to Smith, we have lately visited a museum where we saw an Egyptian mummy and on the headstone, etc., are many ancient and curious characters. Shall we copy them and send them to you for translation? The enthusiasm for finding lost records was captured in a, po a poem titled Inspired Writings by Samuel Brown, 
who speaks of revelations now coming forth in embalmed records, plates of gold, and many more hid in the ground. All these with Enoch's book unfold and, spre and spread true light from pole to pole. Smith set the pattern in B.H. Roberts called for disciples, who growing discontented with the primitive methods which have hitherto prevailed, hitherto prevailed in sustaining the doctrine, will yet take profounder and broader views, and departing from mere repetition, will cast them in new formulas, cooperating in the works of the Spirit until they help to give truths received a more forceful expression and carry them beyond the earlier and cruder stages of development. A number of LDS scholars have accepted the challenge. David Paulson has found early Christian antecedents for a Mormonism social trinity composed of distinct persons. Terrell Givens has traced dozens of Jewish early Christian and medieval varieties of human preexistence. Some Latter-day Saints have appropriated the work of Margaret Barker on temple theology to emphasize Joseph's resituating of the temple at the center of Mormon thought and praxis. And Hugh Nibley wrote thousands of pages on the subject of Egyptian studies to place Smith's Book of Abraham in a tradition of Abrahamic narratives. In light of such a ubiquitous pattern, one would expect that Mormons would be at the forefront of excavating the historical record and textual traditions for footprints of the divine feminine, as they have for a, a whole gamut of their other distinctive and unconventional doctrines. If the Presbyterians have truth, embrace that, Smith, Smith enthused, saying the same went for the Baptists, the Methodists, and other religious traditions. Get all the good in the world if you want to come out a pure Mormon. If God, by way of revelation, encourages people to become acquainted with all good books, with languages, tongues, and people, as well as apocryphal texts, then myriad disciplines were potentially also part of the sacred record. Unsurprisingly, Joseph also claimed that there were many things in the Bible which do not, as they now stand, accord with what the, with what the revelation of the Holy Ghost do mean. Contemporary biblical scholarship appears to be following Smith's skepticism. Kathleen Flake writes that today the Bible itself is believed to be largely the product of periodic manu manipulation of foundational texts. Redaction has become the regnant explanation for the construction of the Bible as having experienced change, accretions, and reinterpretations as it was being transmitted through the centuries. Smith began a wholesale redaction of the biblical text beginning in as early as 1830 and continuing until his death disrupted the project. Smith had made changes to approximately, well this actually isn't approximately, 3,400 biblical verses. These changes were embedded directly into the text and not appended as marginalia. Consonant with Smith's views and practice alike, church president Joseph F. Smith could be, could be seen as simply as implicitly endorsing the search for antecedents to LDS doctrines now lost to the world. When he said, if we find truth in broken fragments, it may be set down as an incontrovertible fact that it originated at the fountain and was given to philosophers, inventors, reformers, prophets, and etc. by the inspiration of God. Efforts to recover fragments of an original truth regarding Heavenly Mother both within and without the biblical text have not only met with a limited enthusiasm in the LDS tradition, but with a great deal of resistance. I can speak from personal experience here. A possible explanation resides in events surrounding the resurgence of interest in both feminism and Heavenly Mother in the closing decades of the 20th century. A number, of prom a number of prominent LDS women publicly advocated the offering of prayer to Heavenly Mother. In addition, general conference addresses were disrupted by women's protests, which served to embarrass the all-male leadership. A series of excommunications followed, and an official church website now states succinctly, Latter-day Saints do not pray to our Mother in Heaven. Even so, more seems at work in the conspicuous lack of LDS engagement with the topic especially in regard to the veritable eruption of interest in the topic outside LDS channels. Margaret Barker, herself a lightning rod for controversy among LDS and non-LDS scholars alike, gives fair warning to those who would venture into the sphere of scholarship engaged in the literary excavation of Heavenly Mother. The most cursory reading, she states, in the field 
reveals it to be a minefield of prejudices and assumptions which take precedence even over the archaeological evidence. With that admonition in mind, the rationale for and purpose of the following section needs to be made clear. A survey of recent scholarship on the feminine divine and her various manifestations in ancient textual and archaeological records will at a minimum, minimum situate an inchoate LDS theology of Heavenly Mother within a longer historical and theological narrative, broken fra fragments that powerfully attest the persistent longing by multitudes across time and culture to find a mother there. If this currently unique Mormon doctrine is to find its precursors in a way analogous to now faded versions of pre-existence, an embodied God and vicarious salvation, then the excavation of both biblical and non-biblical sources are the possible points of departure. I will here trace five antecedents to the LDS conception of the divine feminine, making no claims for continuity or descent or theological cogency. I am merely limbing a persistent pattern. The first god, uh, the first goddess we will encounter, which we do encounter in the biblical narrative, is the goddess by the name of El Shaddai. With the exception of the tetragrammaton YHWH, no divine name has generated so much controversy as El Shaddai or Shaddai, notes David Bile. Harriet Lutsky claims that it is Bile who is the first in the contemporary literature to see the etymology breast as key in understanding the name El Shaddai by taking the compound read as the god with breasts to be the original form. When breast rather than mountain is privileged, the hypothesis that Shaddai was originally the name or epithet of a goddess, the one of the breast, virtually imposes itself. El Shaddai is mentioned 43 times in um, the, the books, um, the patriarchal narratives just prior to Exodus. Um, the hypothesis is reinforced by the fact that in the ancient Near East, breastfeeding of a goddess was a divine act imparting divinity, divine authority, and divine protection. The conception of the Hebrew God as a fertility God, covenantal God of eternal increase, in general, and as represented by breasts in particular, has support in both biblical and extra-biblical sources. For instance, there is evidence in the biblical text itself that the patriarchs worshipped Shaddai in conjunction with El. All the current biblical passages relating to El Shaddai in Gen Genesis, with one exception, are covenantal blessings of increase. Of the five definitive passages where Shaddai is mentioned, presumably written by P, all use the language, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth, which is um, obviously found first in Genesis and then later in Genesis 9, or vary it slightly. In Genesis 17, 1 through 5, the deity appears to Abraham with the name El Shaddai and states, I will make my covenant between me and thee and will multiply thee exceedingly. In Genesis 35, 9 through 15, El Shaddai appears to Jacob, changes his name to Israel, and reiterates the covenant made earlier to his grandfather. And God said to him, I am El Shaddai. Be fruitful and multiply, and a company of nations shall be of thee. To his son Joseph, excuse me. Are we all good? Okay. To his son Joseph, Jacob will later recall how Shaddai appeared unto me at Luz in the land of Canaan and blessed me and said unto me, Behold, I will make thee fruitful and multiply thee, and I will make of thee a multitude of people. The word Luz, um, translated as Bethel, uh, means almond tree. And this is significant because um, it is reputed that the menorah, the symbol of Heavenly Mother, was actually made of an almond tree and, um, and overlaid with go gold. So you're going to find that these modes of worship and um, attributes of the female deities move. Um, there is a, a lot of um, cohesion um, in the modes of worship and in their activities um, that are expressed throughout the biblical text. 
Of all the passage that mention, passages that mention El Shaddai in terms of the covenantal blessings of increase, Bile states that Genesis 49.25 is the most crucial. In his blessing of Joseph, Jacob calls him a fruitful bough, even a fruitful bough by a well whose branches run over. Mark Smith finds the proposed translation of Genesis 49.25.6 by Walter compelling. Joseph is blessed by El, your father, who helps you, by Shaddai, who blesses you, with the blessings of heavens from above, the blessings of the deep crouching below, the blessings of breasts and womb. The next deity I would like to um, talk very briefly, and this is all condensed, there's so much more I could say, but time is of the essence. Um, and I did condense this from about a 200 page thing, so I think I really did jolly well. <laughs> it took me weeks and weeks of tearing out my hair. Um, Shekinah is a derivative of Shekan, meaning dwelling, as to dwell among, as well as resting, settling upon, and tabernacling in. One of the names for the wilderness tabernacle was Mishkan, meaning dwelling or abode. The deity resting upon or tabernacling in the wilderness sanctuary was known as Shekinah, which is a feminine noun. Raphael Katai explains why this feminine gendering is the more durable foundation than may at first appear. In Semitic languages, so Uderak, um, um, Syriac, Aramaic, and Hebrew, um, the verb as well as the noun have separate male and female forms. In the sentence, sentence therefore, the Shekinah rose up and said, therefore, both verbs impress the reader or hearer with the femini femininity of the Shekinah by taking upon themselves the feminine forms. Thus, even without an explicit pronouncement to the effect that the Shekinah was a female divine entity, her sex was kept to the forefront of consciousness by every statement made about her. As a result, it was inevitable that the step from regarding the Shekinah as a manifestation of God to seeing in her a discrete divine entity should be taken. Ultimately, the Shekinah stood for an independent feminine de entity with an opinion, a mind, a will, and a personality of her own. It was for Shekinah the tabernacle was built and into which she descended. William um, and William Bieber also concurs. If, as the old Elohistic tradition claimed, Yahweh merely put in temporary appearances in the tent of the meeting as a visiting deity, then the suggestion that Shekinah is the permanent resident deity is a plausible one. It was an accepted article of faith that with, wherever their exile took the people of Israel, the Shekinah went along with them as a cloud overshadowing them by day and a pillar of light protecting them by night and that she should remain with them until the time of redemption. The deity with, with, with whom you are probably are most familiar is Asherah. It is recorded in First Kings and Elijah, I, uh, excuse me, it is recorded in First Kings that Elijah invites the priests of both Baal and Asherah, the prophets of the grove, which eat at Jezebel's table to the contest of the gods. Remain that, remember that, you know, so my God is bigger and better than your God. There's a whole like, con conflagration that goes on. And, um, of course, um, Elijah's God wins. What is interesting, though, following um, that uh, ceremony, Elijah orders the execution of all the priests of Baal. As the execution does not extend to the priests of Asherah, the text suggests that while Elijah and therefore God found the worship of Baal offensive, the worship of the goddess of the groves or Asherah was not. And this is really fun because we've got these really cool scriptures. So I want you to look up groves, you know, on your, on your phones. And, um, and then you will see that Abraham plants um, a grove of trees um, in a dedication or to deify um, Shaddai who has appeared to him. And in every verse thereafter, the building of groves, the planting of groves is condemned, is absolutely delightful. I don't know how Abraham got off the hook, probably because he was Abraham, but nobody else did. 
the Deuteronomist, maybe they ran out of time by the time they got to that far, I'm not sure. According to Mark Smith, Asherah worship was acceptable in both northern and southern kingdoms and involved the setting up, building, making or planting of wooden poles or stylized trees or groves. The worship of Shaddai included the presence of trees, the building of altars on which to burn incense, the setting up of pillars and the consumption of bread or cakes. This is important because we're going to see this coming up. Trees in high places particularly were the dominant symbol of Asherah's presence. Mark Smith adds that legal prohibitions and prophetic critiques indicate that the devotion of Asher was observed as early as the period of the judges and as late as a few decades before, before the fall of the southern kingdom. And her symbol, the pole, tree, or image was a general feature of Israelite religion. In addition, Saul Olyon argues, the patriarchal narratives of cult founding at Bethel, Hebron, and Bathsheba indicate that the sacred tree and the pillar were legitimate in the Yahwistic cult early on and were not considered illegitimate at the time of the Yahwist or the Elohist. Olyon also argues that anti asherah polemic is restricted to the Deuteronomistic history or to the materials which betray the influence of Deuteronomistic language and theology. The refugees who had fled their homeland in response to the frequent incursions of the Assyrians render a wonderfully detailed synopsis of the worship of Asherah as they rage, anger, against Jeremiah concerning their current lamentable condition, implying that it is a result of Josiah's purging the kingdom of Asherah and her Asherim, which he does, in fact. He actually drags the menorah out of the temple and has it burned and uh, burned to ashes, and then the, um, the ashes of which were then taken to a sacred space, which is most peculiar, of Asherah, interestingly enough. Not, not sure what his beef was with Asherah, but it was definitely um, very, very strong. Okay, so here we have the refugees, the women representing the refugees, um, state that, so they, they're venting to Jeremiah, we are men, our fathers, our kings, and our princes did burn incense to the queen of heaven, poured out drink offering to her, and made cakes to worship her in the cities of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem. Then we wanted for nothing. Having abundant victuals, they were well off and saw no evil. However, since the forced eradication of Asherah work by the government, we have wanted all things and have been consumed by the sword. The cult of Asherah throughout the kingdom and the destruction of his symbol in the temple, the menorah, exemplify the hostility of the Deuteronomist towards the female deity, Asherah. Due to their influence, the mother and her tree have almost been forgotten, except in the Book of Mormon. Asherah, the tree of life, made one happy. Um, and for detailed descriptions of the tree, we have to rely on some canonical, canonical text. Am I missing something? Because we, maybe it's coming up. Maybe it is. Okay, if I don't say this, remember, we've got to go to First Nephi 11. Uh, <laughs> but for detailed descriptions of the tree, we have to rely on non-canonical texts as well. So, for example, a text was discovered in Egypt in 1945, which describes the tree as, okay, this is where I'm introducing the tree of life, um, Nephi's tree of life, um, describes the tree as beautiful, fiery, and with fruit like white grapes. In Daniel Peterson's seminal article, Nephi and his Asherah, he finds similar echoes of Asherah in the tree of life described in 1 Nephi 11, in which the tree of life is described as radiant white, as the driven snow, precious above all, Mary the mother of the Lord after the manner of the flesh is likewise described as exceedingly fair and radiant, Nephi's guide then reopens a vision of Mary being carried away in the spirit, and when they return, he sees her bearing the Christ child and the Lamb of God in her arms. Remember carrying away in the spirit. That's really important. Hang on to that. Carried away in the spirit. Wisdom. Susan Ackerman writes, although many goddesses have been nominated as wisdom's primary antecedent, the most compelling arguments view woman wisdom, lady wisdom, as a reflex of the Canaanite Asherah. Especially notable in this regard is the Proverbs 8 description of woman wisdom as present with and the partner of the Israelite god Yahweh in the creation. 
a tradition that parallels closely both Ugaritic materials that describe Asherah as create, creatress and consort of the creator god El. This is important because the consort of Yahweh. Um, there were three deities originally worshipped in the, in the he uh, by the Hebrews, and they were El, El Shaddai, and Jehovah. Um, and so, so for us, and for me particularly, I think this is a much stronger association of Ashtra wisdom um, with, uh, as consort of El, although we do see during the throughout the biblical text that there is cooperative collaboration between Yahweh and, um, and, and the female deity from the beginning um, through to the very end. Uh, let's see. Um, in Proverbs 3.18, woman wisdom is described as a tree of life, language that not only recalls the ancient should die tradition, but also the tree of life in Genesis 3.22 and is associated with the tree of knowledge of good and evil that so obviously draws from wisdom motifs. But also the stylized polar tree that is frequently associated with the goddess Asherah in biblical literature. That happiness accrues to those who hold fast to wisdom. Um, okay, and we, un we need to understand the word Asherah is um, derivative. Am, 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 I, am I still okay, Boyd? Okay. Oh, holding the mic, sorry. I'm a hobbit. If I do that, then I can't. I can do this. Further alludes to identity as Asherah, as the Hebrew word for happy is a pun on the goddess's name. William Deaver states that Lady Wisdom appears in several Old Testament texts as a partner with Yahweh in creation, then uh, that she goes about on her own, speaking publicly for Yahweh, that she brings, brings specific blessings and long life, and above all, that she's a tree of life to them that lay hold upon her. And I think this is very interesting if we jump then to the restoration text, if we look at Doctrine and Covenants 6, 7, and 11, 7. Seek not for riches, but for wisdom, for um, the mysteries of the kingdom contain everlasting life. So you see this, you see echoes of this within the restoration uh, text as well. Um, and, and, and maybe I should add this really quite quickly. Um, at the uh, 200th, the bicentennial um, celebration of Joseph Smith's birth, um, Margaret Barker was asked to um, look at the Book of Mormon to see whether it could justifiably be um, a, a 700 BC text. And she goes straight to um, Lehi and Nephi's vision of the Tree of Life. And um, she points out that at this time, um, it is, there are two warring, she calls them priesthoods, the De Deuteronomist and the priest, priesthood of the temple. She argues that Lehi is not a Deuteronomist, um, but a priest of the temple because he is in fear of his life. Most of the, our primary restoration text evidences of, link, of the link between the feminine deity and the feminine deity that survived until um, the time of Josiah, where there was a purge towards monotheism, colla collapsing El and um, Yahweh and expunging um, the female deity completely, coming out of, Babylonia, of, of Babylon, the, the Jews were thoroughgoing monotheists. Christ is wisdom's envoy. In speaking of the God of gracious goodness in the earliest Jesus traditions, Elizabeth Schrissler Fiorenza states that she appears in a woman's gestalt as wisdom, Sophia. The earliest Palestinian remembrances and interpretations of Jesus' life understand him as Sophia's messenger and that Jesus and Sophia are collaborators. I will note here that, on another, res that another restoration text in particular also personifies ways in which wisdom is consistent with these precedents. In his lament for his people's enslaved condition, Limhi comments, oh, how marvelous are the works of the Lord, and how long doth he suffer with his people, yea, and how blind and impenetrable are the understandings of the children of men, for they will not seek wisdom, neither do they desire that she should rule over them. And he puts an exclamation mark in there. Engelsman expresses wisdom's status as taught by Philo of, of, of Alexandria. Wisdom is both the mother of the world, its beginning, and the goal of human life. 
Helma, Helma Pringren insists that this wisdom is not an abstraction or a purely poetic personification, but a concrete being self-existent beside God. Perhaps the most famous instance of feminizing the deity is in the longer extant gospel according to the Hebrews, composed early in the second century and frequently quoted by the church fathers. Origen and Jerome both quote a key passage from it in which Jesus says, my mother, the Holy Spirit, took me just now and carried me off to the great Mount Tabor. Now go back to um, 1 Nephi 11. The Holy Spirit took me, Nephi, to a high mountain. So the, the, the language is very important. Jerome elsewhere quotes the Gospel of the Hebrews as indicating that at Jesus' baptism, it came to pass as the Lord came out of the water, the whole fountain of the Holy Spirit descended upon him and rested upon, and rested upon him and said to him, My son, in all the prophets I expected that you might come and that I might rest upon you. Again, you've got that word rest, shakan, and it will also appear in the Syriac term argon, might rest upon you. You are my rest. You are my firstborn son who reigns in eternity. No wonder then, as Susan Ashbrook Harvey writes, it has become commonplace for church historians to point that out that in Syriac Christianity, prior to the year 400, the Holy Spirit was most often understood to be feminine. Johannes van Oort states that the earliest Christians, all of whom were Jews, spoke of the Holy Spirit as a feminine figure. The ancient tradition was in particular kept alive in East and West Syria up to and including the fourth centuries. That's when the, the urbane Greeks appeared with their beautiful, sibilant language and made the Syriacs feel like they were um, rednecks. I think it's the American term. As Sebastian Brock notes, the earliest Christians spoke Aramaic, a dialect of Syriac, which, of course, is also the language of Jesus. Therefore, when referring to the Holy Spirit, they used the feminine forms of adjectives, verbs, and etc. Not until the fourth century did some people because of the Greeks, disapprove of treating the Holy Spirit as grammatically feminine. Before then, in a number of early Syriac works, we encounter spirit as mother. The feminization, he notes, goes beyond mere grammatical form, however. The Gospel of Philip clearly sees the spirit as female, and in the Gospel of Thomas, in the course of several prayers uttered by Judas Thomas, the Greek text includes several invocations to, Holy Spirit, to the Holy Spirit as mother. Johannes von Oort notes that using a typical formulation, the Syriac Christian Macarius, or it could be Simeon, writes, the true heavenly father who is with the good and kind mother, the grace of the spirit. Most surprising to modern Christians is Brock's declaration that in such texts and in the ancient hymn of the pearl, we have clear evidence of a trinity envisaged as consisting of father, mother, and son. Brock notes that the image of the Holy Spirit as, as mother is by no means confined to Syriac writers or those working in a Semitic milieu, and cites the Greek Hippolytus as one example. That among early Christian writers, Greek and Latin, as well as Syriac, one can find scattered pieces of evidence which may suggest that there was once a fairly widespread tradition which associated the Holy Spirit with the image of mother. He finds the roots of this tradition to be in the personalized figure of wisdom, which we have seen above, as well as with the Jewish concept of the divine presence of Shekinah. Another figure, the church father Epiphanius, transmits the revelation given to the Jewish Christian prophet Elksai, in which the Holy Spirit is said to be like Christ, but she is a female being. Such patterns have been little noted until fairly recently, but interestingly enough, the colonial preacher Cotton Mather is a striking exception. ...of comfort so frequently that he paused to make this aside. It has been a little surprising unto me to find that in some of the primitive writers, the Holy Spirit is called the Mother. Tertullian uses this denomination for the Holy Spirit, the Mother, who is invocated with the Father and the Son. Instead of recoiling from the heresy, Matha explained the reasonableness of the metaphor. It is through the Holy Ghost that we are born again. The Holy Ghost is spoken of in the scriptures as a comforter. 
Surely nothing is of greater comfort than a good mother, he states. While a feminized Holy Spirit is one more instance of possible traces of a divine feminine, it obviously entails even more disruptive potential than its counterparts. Since Latter-day Saints, by and large, see the Holy Ghost as a male personage, traditions that conflate the Holy Ghost and Heavenly Mother un are unlikely to gain immediate traction. The Apostle Charles Penrose, however, did venture such a connection. If the divine image, to be complete, had to reflect a female as well as a male element, it is self-evident that both must be contained in the deity, and they are. For the divine spirit that in the morning of creation moved upon the face of the waters, bringing forth life and order, is the feminine gender, whatever modern theology may think of it. However, no subsequent LDS leader has yet to venture further down that path. In conclusion, Mormon feminism has appeared to many as an oxymoron. The combined legacy of plural marriage, still officially a heavenly prospect, and an inclusively male priesthood seem to some observers irremediably hostile to any possibility of a place for woman that is fully equal to and commensurate with the status and dignity of men. At the same time, in two crucial regards, Mormonism has already achieved two feminist landmarks to which Katie Stanton, excuse me, Katie Stanton could only wistfully aspire and which no other Christian tradition has yet to accomplish. A scripturally warranted dogma that places Eve at the forefront as the initiator and bold champion of the entire human family's sojourn on earth and a theological affirmation of the feminine counterpart to God the Father, equal in glory and divinity. What remains at this point is for Latter-day Saints to tap more deeply the potential of a theological framework that has dared to challenge the model of unequivocal patriarchy both on earth and in heaven. Thank you. Yeah, I know. All right, lovely people. Can you t um, please, please take your seats if you want to be involved in the Q&A? My primary children were so much more obedient than you lot. Agency unfettered. <laughs> All right, are there, are there any questions? <laughs> I will answer them to the best of my ability. Yeah. Oh, uh, so um, the, the people who wish, to, oh, there, oh, there is a micro, there's a traveling microphone with a beautiful lady holding onto it, so. All right, oh, 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 oh. <laughs> Lovely void. The lady back <laughs> okay. Um, yes. Yeah. So my question, um, kind of going off a little bit what Christine has said and what you have said, is this idea. Oh, sorry. Can you hear better? Okay. Um, is this idea of like kind of having some righteous anger and being able to express it constructively? So I want that to be a preface. Um, my concern and anger is mostly rooted in fear that um, the Mormon feminist movement is headed up by a cisgender heterosexual binary lens. And with that lens, we, and I don't exempt myself from the problem, pedestalize this idea of feminine deity that just replaces the, 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 it replaces the position of the oppressor. It's now no longer about patriarchy, it's now all about cisgender heterosexual monogamous binary matriarchy. And so what are we doing right now to make sure that Heavenly Mother doesn't adopt the role of the oppressor? Well, I, I think um, the research in which I have been engaged um, really it, it individualizes her. Um, but what I am what I am seeing through the biblical and the non-biblical texts is a collaboration. Uh, there is full equal when there is full equality that allows for full collaboration. And, um, and I'm seeing in my research a collaboration either with the God L, um, as in the text just before the Moses text begins. And it is interesting that there is a sort of a trade-off here. So you have this idea of the burning bush and, and light and fire are very much a part of the feminine divinity. But um, some scholars are saying that it is actually the feminine divine's voice out of the burning bush speaking to Moses, saying that by my name, El Shaddai, I have been known. And there is now going to be uh, not only a, a name switch, but a gender switch. 
And there is some discussion as to whether or not the, the book of Moses is, um, is a figment of someone's imagination. So there's, there, I mean, right now in um, biblical research, everything is on the table. What I am founding, finding as consistent is a collaborative engagement, either between El Shaddai and El, um, or between Yahweh and the various forms, Asherah, Shekinah, Wisdom, um, and then the Holy Spirit. During your talk, you mentioned the phrase that more seems at work in Mormonism regarding the exclusion of Heavenly Mother. You mentioned that there has not been a lot of enthusiasm for the exoneration of her from ancient texts. There hasn't been much scholarship done. Obviously, we can all propose reasons as to why, but from your perspective, and having encountered much of the criticism I imagine directly, what do you believe to be the root cause? What is this more seems to be at work, and how can we eliminate it? Um, well, let me see. I, I think I will answer that qu question by saying that um, there is a movement um, in, in that direction. Uh, I, I think... Um, there is little there is little known. It takes an incredible amount of time and effort to actually plumb um, the ar the archives. Um, most of the important texts are either written in um, Syriac or Aramaic, and some of the really important scholarship has been written in French and German. So um, it does require a number of languages to be able to source everything. That being said, I do feel that there are um, advantages to being such a young church. One, we are vulnerable, and we may, according to some people, be on the verge of annihilation um, with, the, with the, the exodus from our church. We're a small church, so we can't deal with much of an exodus, not like the Catholic Church or some other, other um, uh, Christian dom denominations. On the other hand, it does allow us some room to move. We are not trapped by dogma and doctrine. So for example, after 2,000 years, the Catholic Church came out with a pronouncement saying that perhaps uh, children who died unbaptized would not spend the rest of eternity in hell. So after 2,000 years, we can get a perhaps. As a younger church, um, there are lots of theological claims that are made, being made, but our theology is often inconsistent and it is most definitely in code, which allows us room to move. Now, and I am seeing this actually in the engagement of, um, of women. So um, we all know of the changes that have been made in, um, in, in actually all three, initiatory endowment and sealing, um, uh, that in many ways um, are a step forward uh, for women as being, as um, reincorporating their equality um, also, Elder Ballard has been circum cir circumnavigating the globe for decades, I think, talking about councils. And we do see that. We do see that, at least on a practical le level, the role of women is being divested more of the, you know, you're at the home single mother too, you have other talents and use those talents, which was, ironically enough, um, Brigham Young's mantra. You know, it's women can work just as well as men, let them, you know, so... Um, so I do see that moving, and I feel that the two are commensurate. You know, as I've I tried to outline in my in my talk, that that the movement of one inevitably encourages the movement of the other. So I'm actually quite optimistic um, that we are moving in 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 this direction. And um, at the moment, the um, not only is the um, textual evidence fairly overwhelming, but the archaeological evidence. Is, is really, really stunning at uh, some of it. And, and I, I wrote myself some notes because after six children, I have no brain <laughs> left at all. Six is enough to form a cabal. <laughs> they did. They stole my brain, and they haven't had the decency to return it. <laughs> so I have to write notes for myself because um, I need them. Um, but there are several, and I, of course, I'm not going to find them now that I need them. There are several sites. Oh, yes, here we are. There are some really important sites that have been unearthed. I'm going to go through them and tell you why they are important and why it adds a lot of oomph to, what, um, to the supposition that um, the feminine divinity was a real uh, 
real divinity in the biblical text. So at Tel Tanakh in 1963, excav excavations were made with the discovery of a large assembly of loom weights, which is really interesting because there is this idea of Asherah being the goddess of weaving. And then you see this in contextual texts. Um, uh, it, uh, the, the idea of um, Asherah weaving um, uh, the universe. Um, she is the being who keeps, holds all things together. Um, and this was important because they were discovered at a site where other Asherah um, cult symbols um, were um, found. And particularly important was the one at the same site, Tal uh, Tatanakh in 1968, there was a discovery of three cult stands, the fam most famous of which is a rectangular shaped object standing over half a meter in tall. And the iconography has suggested that the 10th century BCA Tanakh was a site associated with a worship of Asherah, primarily because in the first register, so it's, it's divided into four registers one, two, three, four. And, um, and, th and they're sculpted. So in the first register, there's a woman with a Hathor rib, a definite sign of a female deity, and, and she is holding um, the heads of two lionesses, or two lions, it's difficult to know. But these are all strong components that this actually is Asherah, <coughs> because lions are associated with her, so is the Hathor wig. Um, and then on the third register, even more compelling, lions flank two caprids, they're a type of goat, I had to look that up myself, that, that are rearing up and seem to be grazing on a stylized tree. Um, for anybody uh, now involved in that is obviously Asherah. So there are a number of um, sites that, are being, that have been unearthed that are also adding um, archeological evidence to this. So there's a lot going on. And, and I'm, I'm very optimistic. Uh, because we, we are the only tradition who has advanced the fact that there is a separate female deity um, who is equal in every respect to God. So we are actually further along, um, theologically, uh, you know, but we, there's still room to cover. We're a young church. I'm optimistic. Very welcome. <laughs>